And so the people who stopped the experience, they sang a hymn or they called for Jesus to help them. And then they woke up. That's your abduction experience. These people never went anywhere. What we're dealing with here is not a physical experience, not a physical taken to a ship experience. We're dealing with a demonically inspired visionary spiritual experience that these people are given sensational impacting abbreviated enough to get their attention and to make them believe it was real and question their reality because this is a game changer to anybody that has it happen to them this is what the experience is and this is the finding that is upsetting the ufo community this is not what they want to hear. They want to hear this is real. They want to hear this is coming from physical beings. They don't want to hear that this is a spiritual experience because that opens up a whole nother can of worms. This is going to be an intense interview. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. And this is a topic that I kind of got into and out, out of in the new age. Um, I would go to Sedona and we would look for aliens there in South Point and Hawaii and I was, of course, a frequent guest before I was saved on George Norrie's Coast to Coast. And this was a topic that often came up about aliens. And I get a lot of letters asking about them. To the gentleman who you will meet today in this video, his name is Joseph Jordan. And he has been researching from a biblical worldview as a born-again Christian, UFOs and UFO abductions. And he is a 27-year member of the Mutual UFO Network, which is the world's oldest, largest, all-volunteer, not-for-profit, civilian, secular UFO investigation and research organization. He also is the national director of the, the acronym MUFON for, for South Korea, and the state section director for Brevard County in Florida. Um, he's a MUFON Rapid Deployment Star Team member and a member of the MUFON Inner Circle. So this guy really knows what's going on. By profession, he's a safety professional for Blue Origin Rocket Manufacturing Facility in Merritt Island, Florida, which is adjacent to the Kennedy Space Center. Very interesting. He's a born-again Bible-believing Christian. He's the head of CE4 Research Group. We're going to have a link to their website in the description below. This is an investigative research group that studies the so-called alien abduction phenomenon from a Christian perspective. I want to note that to the people who've had these experiences, it's very real and very physical, and he's going to address that today. He recently released a new book called Piercing the Cosmic Veil, You Shall Not Be Afraid of the Terror by Night where the published findings of the 20 plus years of CE4 research group lean toward a more likelihood of the visitors being of an interdimensional or spiritual nature rather than an extraterrestrial biological nature. And this book is now available for pre-order. The link is in the description below along with his social media. Joe, thank you so much for joining me. I know you're very busy. Hey, thank you for having me on, Doreen. What are the statistics about the number of people or the percentage of people who actually believe in UFOs? Well, right now, they, the statistics show that 70 to 80 percent believe in UFOs. Oh, the 60 percent believe in extraterrestrial life is possibly out there um, somewhere in the in the universe. OK, so those are the numbers we're looking at right now. Um, Actually, those numbers are higher than those that believe in Christianity, just to make a point there. I know that you've researched UFO abduction experiences. Mm -hmm. And to people who've had these experiences, they're, they're very real, right? They, yes, They absolutely. were physical experiences. They felt like they were taken to a ship. They felt like they were paralyzed. After 20, 25 years of this research, working with over 600 plus cases of abductions, we have found that the name and authority of Jesus Christ and a personal relationship with him can not only stop this experience, but terminate it as a life pattern. Absolutely terminate it as a life pattern. There's no other name out there, not Krishna, not Buddha, not Allah, 
not Mohammed, not any other name will stop this experience as a life pattern. It may stop the experience in, at, a, at a single moment, but there's always a trade for it. And, but it's not something that will stop it as a life pattern. Only the name and authority of Jesus Christ will do that. And a, a real relationship with him. You've got to shut those doors. And that's what this is all about. This is a war for your soul. And this is the most important thing that people need to understand. This is a war that the enemy is perpetrating upon humanity. But at the same time, believers in Jesus Christ are sitting on the most powerful weapon in the universe. That authority through the name and authority of Jesus Christ. That name is a name above all names. There's not, a, there's not an entity out there that that name will not put in its place. Could you just um, differentiate calling on Jesus in, in the throes of a UFO experience and deliverance ministry? I mean, because that's completely different where you're casting out demons. This is not that, right? No, I've, I've never worked as a deliverance type ministry mm -hmm. at all. Um, in the research, something that did happen that caught us off guard. Um, I started out of this as just a researcher. I was just going to document these testimonies because it was something that wasn't being documented. I thought this was a piece of the UFO puzzle that as a researcher, I needed to develop this findings database to be able to show the world that this is a piece that you better be looking at. This is a piece that's a game changer to what the puzzle is going to look like. But something happened along the way. As we started posting these testimonies of people being able to stop the experience and get their lives back through a relationship with Jesus Christ, emails started showing up that caught us off guard. And those were, can you help us? Can you help me? Well, now that everything changes, because that's changing it from a researcher to a ministry. And that's where we ended up taking this. We're still researchers, but it's also taken it into a ministry. Because I had to answer them by saying, well, with what we have found in, our, in these testimonies that we have posted and the work that we have done, Yes, I believe that this same thing will help you. So what we have here is something else that the UFO community doesn't have, and that's repeatability. Because working with the scientific method, you should be able to show that you can repeat the event, okay? Well, nobody's been able to call down the same craft in the sky twice, <laughs> Not even once, hardly, but twice. So there's no repeatable event in ufology, but this. Because if somebody says, I saw your testimonies where people have said they've stopped this in the name and authority of Jesus Christ, can you help me? Well, if I show them what they did, and if you follow what they did, it should work for you. And it does. Now I have another testimony. And now they can share with the next person and they can share with the next person. This is a repeatable event. This is what they've been looking for. This is what scares them. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord that he is available to help us as he promised. He's with us always, even into the end of time. And that, um, this, I, I'm so touched by your research and your ministry and your testimonies. It's just amazing. Praise the Lord. You know, I have to tell you that after 20 some years of doing this, and, and you mentioned, you know, the, the Navy seeing these photos or videos and seeing the, the objects that they're seeing and we being able to see the videos of what they're seeing. Um, that's just given more clarity to all of this and giving more um, understanding to the general public that, yes, something is going on. And because of that, 
I think that right now is probably the best time in humanity's history for God's church, the believers in Jesus Christ, to be able to witness to the lost. Because we are speaking the same language. The vocabulary may be a little different, but we're speaking the same language. If you listen to what they're talking about when they talk about those Navy footage that they're, that they're showing, everything is pointing to something that they're using the term interdimensional, that this could be an object that's coming in from another dimension. Everything that they're trying to say and show that they say has technology that's enabling these objects to do this, it's not technology. What we're seeing that they're trying to explain by using the term of technology is something that as believers, we already know. We already know that angels have been able to do exactly the same thing. And it's been their natural ability. When you look at the appearances of angels throughout biblical history in God's word, the abilities that they have, the abilities that they've shown are mirroring what this UFO phenomenon is, is, is doing right now. There's no difference if you take a spiritual being that manifests itself into a burning bush or a human being or to whatever it needs to appear as for God's message or whether it needs or you take a demonic spirit and it manifests as a tic-tac or a gimbal or whatever these guys are calling these objects for deception. It's the same exact thing okay. going on. Uh -huh. It's not technology. It's the natural ability of manifestation to appear as what it needs to appear to get its point across. God did it to get us a point across with his angels to messages to believers. The demonic is doing the same thing as a deception. Yeah, it makes sense. In Exodus, we read about Pharaoh's sorcerers who are able to mimic physically God's miracles to a degree. And it is a counterfeit from Satan. Yes. And it lines right up with what, we're, what the research is finding with abductions. This whole thing that if we're dealing with a spiritual experience with the abduction phenomenon, then if it's all part of the same deception, then the physical objects that are being tracked on radar, seen visually, chased by pilots, then those are just manifestations coming from the same spiritual entity. And thus manifestations are no different than manifestations that happened in the Bible, except they're not from God's angels, mm -hmm. they're from the demonic angels. That's really clear. Thank you. What we found was something very... Uh, significant in the UFO community, uh, research community. 20 some years ago now, when we started into all of this as CE4 research, and the reason we set up CE4 research is because as we started into the abduction research, we realized that uh, MUFON wasn't, we were MUFON field investigators, the, the original group. And um, as we were researching and following up investigations on UFOs, uh, we were also holding our monthly meetings and encountering people who claimed that they were abduction experiencers. Well, as we started putting one and, you know, one, and one together equals two, uh, we started realizing that if these people were claiming that they were in contact with the people or the entities or beings on the ships, then wouldn't it make more sense to investigate them than following up with a sighting report, because these people, to me, were frontline, and that's where the research needed to go to, if we were going to find true answers on this phenomenon. So that's why we formed CE4 Research, because at the time, MUFON had no real way of investigating abductions. So we decided to set up a separate entity uh, and make sure that all of our findings were always available for peer review and for you know anybody that wanted to look at them. So they've always been there on the internet uh, for people to look at. And I always present them when I do my talks or do my shows. So it, it's nothing that we've, we've had hidden. 
right in the beginning, as we started putting this together, we wanted to put use a scientific method uh, to, to start this off. And we put out there our own hypothesis, and the hypothesis was a question in the, in the form of a question, are Christians being abducted by aliens? Because this was a time, 1996, uh, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I had also come out of the New Age. Um, I started out in this whole phenomenon with UFOs, uh, having no knowledge of UFOs. Uh, I was a science fiction fan, but I got introduced to it by just picking up one book that hooked me. At, at that time, I was an agnostic humanist, but it wasn't long before I saw the mix of the new age with the UFO phenomenon, and I got hooked into the whole new age and ended up spending a few years into that. But by 1996, when I started seeing some dark aspects of the abduction experience, um, I had a Christian that actually offered me some a way that I could protect myself from this besides my crystals in my pocket um, that I said, you know what, I want that protection. And that's when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Well, now as a Christian UFO investigator, um, I said, let's put this hypothesis out there. Are Christians being abducted by aliens? And I thought this would be just a simple piece of work. Uh, we'll get a simple answer probably no, and then we can move on to the next one. Well, it wasn't simple. What we ended up with was yes and no. And that really confused us in the beginning. We didn't expect that. Um, the reason I say yes and no is because we found out that we had come across two different types of Christians. Those that were, we termed walk the walk believers and those that we term talk the talk believers. They were both believers, but one chose to live their life in a true relationship with Jesus Christ. And those that were still keeping doors open to the world. And those that were still keeping doors open to the world were ones that were, were Christians that were still having these experiences, were having this type of experience. And that is what led us into deeper research. Um, right after we started into all of this, we came across an unusual case where a gentleman during his experience said that he had stopped the experience um, while it was happening. Well, early on into our research studies, as we were preparing to get into abduction research, we just decided to study up as much as we could on the phenomenon so that we wouldn't affect uh, any more these people that were having the experiences because these people were were very uh, distraught people that were having these abduction experiences. Most of them were showing some major signs of PTSD. Um, their lives had been turned upside down. Uh, they, they'd lost jobs. They'd lost family. Um, they didn't know how to handle this situation at all. And there was there wasn't many people they could talk to, and there was no help for them. You know, there were so-called uh, support groups, but, you know, trying on each other's shoulder about something is not a way to really help each other. It's a way to sort of cope with it, but it doesn't help the problem. Um, so we didn't want to cause any more damage to these people, so we studied up on it. But during our studies, we, we realized that the researchers were saying, one, these experiences couldn't be stopped, especially as a permanent life pattern, because this experience continues to happen during a person's life. Um, but they were saying this wasn't possible to stop it as a life pattern. Second, they are still asking the question to this day, why does this even happen to certain people? And there's a lot of people running all sorts of crazy ideas out there like RH negative blood, all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, but that's not the true answer to that. But these are the things that we had come up against um, to, to look at. Well, this guy says that he had stopped his experience while it was happening. Well, I thought, wait a minute. They said that wasn't possible. And we had to take a look at this. And as I went and talked to these leading researchers, you know, nice people like myself, you can call them and talk to them. Um, I did. I shared the case with them. 
And that's when I found out that they also had come across cases where people had stopped the experience. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting was the way that the experience had been stopped. This gentleman that I had come across that we had taken his testimony, he said that he had called out in the name and authority of Jesus Christ, he said, Jesus, Jesus, help me. And the experience abruptly stopped and he woke up in bed. Well, these leading researchers off the record, they told me that they too had come across similar cases where people had either hummed a hymn or sang a hymn or quoted scripture uh, or something of the sort and the experience stopped. And I said, but you guys said that this couldn't be stopped. And they said, well, their answers were, we didn't know what to make of it. And I would have been fine with that, except that they had to go and give me another excuse. And it said, the excuse was, we were afraid to go there because it might affect our credibility in the UFO research community. Mm. So that's withholding information. Yeah, that's pridefulness too. That's cover up. Mm -hmm. So if you've been involved in this realm, at all, you've heard the word cover up, and it's always government cover up this, government cover up that. Excuse me, if you have any involvement in this realm, I will tell you that the leading researchers themselves have agendas, and they are covering up information that they don't want you to hear, like what you're hearing from me today. Um, this is, I've called my talk, you know, the unwanted piece of the UFO puzzle for years because it's not the piece that they want to hear. Um, what we came across with this gentleman was, yes, this did happen this way with him. And because I now know that there are more cases out there, I, went, I put myself and C CE4 Research in a position where we went looking for those testimonies like this one, the first one we had. And sure enough, they started coming in because now people had somebody to share it with because these secular researchers didn't want to hear it. No, they weren't going to publicize it. They weren't going to share that this was a piece of the UFO puzzle that needed to be looked at. So I did gather these pieces and that's what CE4 research has been doing all these years is we've been gathering these testimonies of people that have been able to stop this experience, not just while it's happening, by calling on the name and authority of Jesus Christ, but by continuing to make it stop as a life pattern, to, to make it completely go away in their life through a personal relationship and walk with him. And that's what we've been able to show, that this is a demonically inspired experience. And it even gets deeper in that, because some of the questions that they're still asking is, like I said, why does this even happen to some people? Well, we found an answer for that. Not just one, but we found three answers. And it could either be one or a combination of the three. First one, people ask for this. Uh, and your listeners are probably going, who would ask for that? Well, believe me, people Oh, do. yeah, they do. I yeah. remember when I yeah. followed Dr. Stephen Greer, people would spend thousands of dollars to go yes. with him to places like Sedona, Arizona, to ask to be taken upon a UFO craft. Absolutely. Um, been, I was one of those people that used to stick my head out the window on the way home from UFO meeting, yelling, show me something, mm -hmm. you know, people be careful what you ask for. Yeah. Be really careful. The second one is probably the biggest. The second answer is People unknowingly open a door or many doors <laughs> to allow this experience to happen in their life. And when I say doors, I'm talking about doors that are referred to in scripture and God's holy word, the Bible, things that he tells us not to mess with. There's a reason for that is because it gives the enemy a right to affect us in our lives. And that's the biggest open door area that I see is at number two, unknowingly dabbling in areas you shouldn't have. You shouldn't be like new age, metaphysics, 
the paranormal of any type, um, any of those can open you up to this experience. And just a little bit can open you up. That's why I said these, these talk to talk believers, you know, you may be a believer, but if you haven't shut those doors in your life, you're still giving them an opportunity to affect you. The third one puzzled me for a while when I, when I first came across it, it was adults. As I was publicizing the first two, I had a couple of adults come to me and said, you know, I've had these experiences since I was a child. I don't fit those first two. There's got to be another reason why I've had these experiences, especially that early. Well, I had to go back and do a little deeper scripture research in, on this one, and it, I found it. And so I went back and started re-interviewing these particular people that claimed they had experiences uh, remembering since childhood. And I started asking different sets of questions, not about their experiences, but about what they can remember about their family life. And what I found out, lo and behold, were the open doors were with the parents. And scripture talks about that because the spiritual covering over the family comes from the head of the household. And listen carefully, dads or single moms, if you're not keeping that spiritual covering over your family in your household, your household is as susceptible to the enemy's wiles as you are. And that's what I found. In every case, that open door was coming through the parents and it fit, the, it, fit it right to a T. So we have answers for why this affects certain people. And it, 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 I can find that every time when people come to me and they want to, you know, find out why this is happening to them. Now, taking it back to the experience itself, this is where the biggest find came in. Um, you stated it in the beginning. People believe this experience is as real as real can be. Well, keep in mind that Anybody that thinks they've had this type of experience, it always starts out like this. They come to somebody like a researcher that deals with abductions, and they say, you know, I've had these dreams. That's how it starts. It should have finished right there, yeah. to tell you the truth, but it doesn't. Because there's somebody there that you've gone to to try to get answers from. So there's a number of things going on there that I'll get to in a minute. Um, as I started working with these cases, I would take their and note, you know, and record these cases, their testimonies of their experience. But as we got deeper and deeper into the research, especially with a, uh, one of my peer researchers, Gary Bates, who wrote Alien Intrusion, um, we started seeing, Gary did especially, started seeing a similarity between the experience itself, the people's testimony, what they were describing, and stage hypnosis. Mm -hmm. Not what I'm not talking about research, researchers doing regressive hypnosis. I'm talking about stage hypnosis, where somebody gets up on the stage and, and the, the, the stage hypnotist is having you perform things um, by using power of suggestion. And we started looking deep into this and I started re-interviewing the, the testimonies again and having them go back through their experience and ask them questions. Keeping in mind, I never use hypnosis. I don't like hypnosis. I don't agree with it. I don't think it's accurate. Yeah. I don't think it's trustworthy. Yeah. I think that you can get honest answers by asking the right questions. And I'm a safety professional by, by trade. I can ask the right questions to get to a root cause of an incident, okay? I use the same tactics as with my MUFON trainings when I ask questions for these cases. For instance, I can ask you about your last birthday. And you remember your last birthday, but the most memorable parts of your last birthday are the most sensational things to you but believe it or not the whole day is in here all i got to do is sit you down and start asking the right questions to get you to bring those memories back up but they're all there 
all, all the senses were recorded. Touch, smell, feel, sight, hearing, everything was recorded, okay? So I can ask you all the questions to get a very detailed experience myself about how you enjoyed that day. I should be able to do the same thing with these experiencers about their trip aboard their spaceship that they went on and the medical exams that they had, right? Mm -hmm. It doesn't work that way. Now, the researchers that do these hypnotic regressions will tell you they get to these areas that are blocked, where the memories don't come out. Their excuse is that they'll tell you that the beings put blocked on the person's memory so they can't recall them. I say, that's not true. I say they're not there. Because what I found out when I reinvestigated and re-interviewed these people as I went through and, and had them relive the story, I'd say, stop. I want you to look to your left. I want you to look to your right. I want you to stop and pause in the thought of where you're at in the ship. Tell me what you smell. Tell me what you feel. Tell me what the temperature is like. Do you feel any breeze? Do you feel temperature? Do you feel hot or cold? It's all the senses aren't operating during the experience. And this happened case after case after case. In other words, what was happening here is the memory is only the sensational aspects of the experience, enough to make it so impacting, so sensational, that it doesn't need to be any more to make you a believer. Because you are in absolute shock from the experience. It's like shock and awe we heard during the war. That is what you're going to remember. Let me give you an example. You ever been to a play? Yes. So you're sitting in the audience at a play. And during the play, they're going to change the scenery to a living room scene. Mm -hmm. So they put up a couch, they put up a love seat, they put up an end table with a lamp on it. They put up a couple pictures on a blank wall. And in your mind, you're going, oh, this is, a, this is a living room scene. Now, does it have all the detail that your living room has? No. But it has enough sensational, mm -hmm. impacting things there for you to realize that it is a living room. Mm -hmm. This is exactly the way these experiences work. Let me give you the best example there probably is. And most of us just laugh it off because we don't believe it. Most people have seen the movie, The Matrix. Let's take it back to the first movie. If you remember the movie, The Matrix, Neo goes to the submarine. He gets plugged into the Matrix for the first time. They lay him on a table or this reclining like chair table. And they take this thing and they plug it into the back of his head. Immediately, Neo was in this white space. And then he's trying to adjust. And then a couch shows up. And again, furniture. Furniture shows up. And then Morpheus shows up and starts talking to him. Well, my question is, where's Neo? Mm -hmm. Neo's still on that recliner bed That's chair true. with that thing plugged in. That's your abduction experience. These people never went anywhere. What we're dealing with here is not a physical experience, not a physical taken to a ship experience. We're dealing with a demonically inspired visionary spiritual experience that these people are given. Okay? Sensational impacting, abbreviated, enough to get their attention and to make them believe it was real and question their reality. Because this is a game changer to anybody that has it happen to them. This is what the experience is. And this is the finding that is upsetting the UFO community. This is not what they want to hear. They want to hear this is real. They want to hear this is coming from physical beings. They don't want to hear that this is a spiritual experience because that opens up a whole nother can of worms mm -hmm. because there's a whole lot of red flags that come with this experience. 
there's communication that comes with this experience. So a lot of people that have it. And that communication is always a new alien gospel. It's always anti-Christ, anti-God, anti-creation, anti-Bible, and you keep going. And with all the different belief systems on this planet, why is it against only one? Why would these beings come across vast distances of the universe just to slam one belief system? So this is like 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, where the devil masquerades as an angel of light, but in this case masquerades as a alien. It fits the culture. Let me tell you something here. The, one of the things that the leading researchers tell you, and you will hear in TV shows and everything else, is that this UFO phenomenon is a worldwide event. Given there's cases that they can pick from around the world, but this is not a worldwide event. This is another one of those falsisms that they're promoting. I lived overseas in Korea for the past 11 years. I just got back to the States. When I got over to the U to Korea, I wanted to know how they were dealing with this UFO phenomenon. They weren't. There was no UFO phenomenon. There was maybe 20 cases in 20 years. And those were by people who were watching American TV, most likely. The phenomenon isn't big to them. They don't care about it. They don't look for it. It's, it. They don't have time for it is what they say. They say, we're, we're too busy. We don't have time for that. And it puzzled me when I heard that answer. What does it mean you don't have time for that? Also did 20 trips to Japan for my job while I was over there. I got to meet good Japanese people. And I talked to them about it. Japanese are open to it. They do have time on their hands to look at this phenomenon where the Koreans don't. The Koreans are busy. They're trying to become the, the top technological country in the world. They, the kids work 14, 10, 12, 14 hours a day at school. Uh, the parents are working to pay for their colleges. Everybody is busy. Now, don't get me wrong. They do spend time outside where they can see the sky because their biggest pastime is hiking and bicycling with family so they are outside it's they're not seeing anything because they're not giving themselves over to it to mm -hmm. see it japan they are because they have more time on their hands they've met their heyday as used to be everything we bought was from japan now it's becoming korea so i look at japan as uh taking that step back and relaxing mm -hmm. spending time looking at crazy things on the internet um, and they're starting to have experiences. They're starting to see things. Then you go to Western modernized countries like America, Canada, Europe. What do they got going on? They're getting slammed with this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So when you put this together logically as a researcher, this whole thing's based on time on your hands. Mm -hmm. Imagine that. So we're right back to what I found in my, why does this happen to certain people? Because you asked for it, or you unknowingly opened the door to it. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you've been messing around, you've been giving it time. And that's what we're seeing over and over. That's so interesting. And so the people who stopped the experience, they sang a hymn, or they called for Jesus to help them. And then they woke up, or... You know, Dolores Cannon used to say a lot of these experiences happened when people were driving in cars and the car would stop and they'd be lifted out and go taken to a ship. And then when it was over, they were back in their car and didn't really have any memory of it. At some point, they did have a memory because that's when the story, they asked somebody about it. But remember, it's always after the fact. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's always somebody else has helped him regain that memory. Right. And that's where the danger comes in. Okay. okay? They don't remember it right after the, the experience and they wake up outside their car or inside their car going and remember everything. No, it's later that they remember mm -hmm. because it never happened. It was a visionary memory that was given to them. This is almost in the... It's almost fitting into the aspect of 
what um, psychology calls yeah. false memories. False memory syndrome, right? right. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, here's where this ties into the stage hypnosis. And I wanted to bring you back to that is stage, hip, stage hypnotists work this way. They're not really putting you into a hypnotic trance. They're using the power of suggestion, which is very powerful. If you really get into the study of it, it's fascinating what can be done with, to us just through suggestion. I've watched this guy, Darren, Darren Brown, um, English guy that had a show on uh, TV in England. And he's fascinating to watch. Some of the shows you can see on YouTube and there's one on Netflix. Um, if you watch him, you'll see what he can do with the power of suggestion in the human mind. There's one where he uses suggestive scenes as he's talking to a person to set up the idea that this person had a favorite childhood toy of a, a red bicycle or something like that. But when they finally get them inside into the audience, in front of an audience, on stage, the whole works. And he's questioned about it. He says, absolutely. It was a red bicycle. The whole works. Because he set him up with the suggestion in his mind where he built that memory of that red bicycle just from suggestions. And then he brought his mom up there and he asked his mom if he ever had a red bicycle. And he said, no, he never did. When they come to the truth that they have been deceived, I don't try to tell them right off the bat when I'm working with them that they've been deceived. I don't do that. That's not what you do. That's not my job. My job is to just show them the issues of this experience. Show them the red flags that keep coming up. Show them the things that just don't make sense. Let the Holy Spirit take over and show them the truth. And they do. And that way they own it. And that way they've come to the truth that, my God, I've been deceived. Yeah. And and so, Joe, you also said that in your research, there were some people who were not Christians who called for Jesus to help them. And that that was part of their testimony later that they came to Christ. Oh, absolutely. If, if you know, in scripture it talks about that, you call on him, he's going to be there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it is it's kind of hard in today's society, especially in in America, that you've never heard of Jesus Christ. Um, odds are you you've heard of him, yeah. you're denying it. So when it comes to that fear factor moment that you're in sheer panic, um, that might be the name you end up calling yeah. out because you know that it just might work. And believe me, when you see him work in your life, you're a believer at that point. Oh, man. You have yeah. no doubt. You will be changed. And these people, they're changed. That's beautiful. It's like the saying, there's no atheist in a foxhole. Exactly. Yeah. Today, you're, you're, you're talking to me as CE4 Research. It's just that my background has been with MUFON. I don't represent MUFON with my findings today. Uh, they have not been accepted by MUFON as of yet. Um, they do understand, and I've gotten comments from many of the leading directors over the years that the guy did the work right. Uh, I'll take that. Um, they're just not accepting of the findings. So okay. away we go. Okay, that's very fair and good to lay that foundation. Really appreciate it. I used to really follow Dr. Stephen Greer, and I would hear all these Navy personnel uh, and Air Force personnel go on George Norrie and talk about seeing UFOs and pilots, of course. And then I know we're going to get letters from people who are professing Christians who are going to argue, but God made the universe. And who are we to arrogantly say that there's only life on Earth? That's our thinking of what God would think. But what does God say about it? That's the question. What does he actually say about it? And if you look at scripture, God says that he made those objects out there that we see for signs and seasons. That is the information that he's given us on what they're for. We do know that scripture talks about the hosts of heaven, but those hosts of heaven are spiritual hosts of heaven, the angelic realm. 
Okay, they're not physical beings like us. They are they're God's angelic hosts. Um, he created them as he created us. But no mention of other life out there. It, it's our thinking that we're trying to put in God's thoughts that drive us to think, why would this universe be so big? You know, that it would be empty. You get to the end in Revelation and you look at who's in heaven, okay, at the end. Who's in heaven? The only people that make it to heaven are the heavenly hosts that are there and the descendants of Adam, mm -hmm. the righteous descendants of Adam. So nobody else. No, it doesn't. And so I know I'm going to get letters about this. So I'm just going to say it. People argue with me all the time that God created the stars. Therefore, we should use astrology, which is illogical and unbiblical and people are going to write us letters about the pleiades being in the bible but that doesn't mean that they're populated is what you're saying no. it doesn't say that just because no, he created the that. stars he created the light he says you know for signs and seasons you know yes. and, and you will see that all through you know scripture that that those signs and seasons were important you know there's a time that it can be taken back to even science uses the stars for pinpointing time. You know, it's fascinating. Uh, years ago, when uh, one of my uh, peers that worked with me at the beginning of CE4, uh, he, he just was dying to do this talk, you know, and I said, go ahead, let's put it together. And he put together a talk and the, the, the talk was, was the star of Bethlehem, a UFO. Oh, and, I've, uh, I've heard that theory, you know, and he put together this fascinating talk along with the work that was uh, given to us from the local planetarium we have here at the college. And uh, they kind of do this presentation every Christmas. And what it does is the planetarium uses a program that takes the stars back in time to where you can go right back to that present time uh, where Jesus was born and look at the stars of what the heavens look like over that period of time from Bethlehem, okay? And when, you, when, when he got to the end of his talk, um, hands were shooting up, you know, and, and questions. And it's like, for, the main question was, well, where's the UFO? And he said, exactly. It uh, wasn't. Uh... Science shows you by taking these signs, you know, these signs and mm -hmm. seasons back by computer, because everything is, is, you know, doesn't change. You yeah. can take it all back, you know, computerized now in a planetarium, right back to a day and a time and a location. And you can see exactly what it looked like. Very there was similar. no UFO. It was a conjunction of a number of planetary objects that was totally significant to people that saw it. They yeah. knew this was important. Yeah, it was the, the prophecy of the Messiah fulfilled. Yeah. Well, um, let's go to kind of address some of the skepticism that's going to come up from this video. Sure. Um, one is, of course, Stephen Greer did a, a video, a documentary where he showed uh, a body of an alien from Roswell that was taken from the craft and he did a, an operation on this body. And then the second thing is going to be the peop the Air Force and the pilots who actually say they see craft, unidentified craft. So how does that fit in with that these are from demons? Um, no evidence of a body. Let me, let me put the facts straight right now. There's apps, it, I'm talking with my MUFON hat on now, mm -hmm. just for a moment. Okay. MUFON, the largest, re, you know, secular, nonprofit, grassroots research organization in the world been around since 1969 as hundreds of thousands of documented, you know, cases that have been turned in. They will tell you that there is no evidence, zero, zip, nada, for extraterrestrial visitation. We've got nothing. So when Stephen Greer says that he's got a body from Roswell, show it. You can say all you want. Stories are a dime a dozen until you show the evidence. This is about evidence. People can tell you, I believe this, I believe that, or I've got this, or I've got that. Show the evidence. This is the one thing that I've done 
in the years that I've had the opportunity to stand on stage and share my findings is, and, and I've made this comment during my talks, this is, I don't bring you fuzzy pictures or fuzzy videos of UFOs. I bring you hard evidence and I bring the testimonies themselves up on stage. I bring these people to the stage in living person so that these People watching this can ask them questions themselves. Don't trust me. Don't ever trust me. Trust the evidence that I bring you because the evidence will speak for itself. The evidence that these people's lives have been changed from being destroyed from this experience to being able to get their lives back through a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is the evidence of what's truly behind this experience. That is the evidence that I can bring you that's real, that you can touch, that you can talk to, that you can relate to. But you know what happens when I bring those people to the stage and I say, test the evidence? Nobody will talk to them. Mm. You know why? Because they're afraid. Yeah. They're afraid that it will be the truth. And that truth is going to make them change, which is change. what they're afraid of. That's right. Yeah. When you are saved by Jesus, you're given a new life and a completely, for me, it was 180 degree change yep. in my worldview. And so it, it is, it's, it disrupts everything. <laughs> you know, and, you bring a good point there about changing your worldview, because in the end, what I see this phenomenon is in its purpose the whole purpose of this deception, which is what I believe this whole phenomenon is, is, is a grand delusion. And this purpose of this delusion is to take one's eyes away from the one true God, which it does to every single person that gets involved in it, whether they're a Christian or a non-Christian. It will take your eyes away from the one true God and his word. It will get you to mistrust his word if you're a believer, Christian believer, because you will start doubting, did God really say that? Or why didn't he say that? This is what this phenomenon does to you. And when you look at it in that aspect of it, that takes me to 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 13 where I wonder who's really behind this delusion in the first place. We know that it's being perpetrated by demonic forces. In every aspect, we see that. It's all about lies and deceit and deception. But as a delusion, as a grand delusion, where other aspects are part of it, the New Age is, is, its, belief, is, its, is, its, um, is its worship system. You know, all of this is part of it one big delusion the whole paranormal is it all has the same outcome and that delusion in second thessalonians it says that god sends this strong delusion and it gives a reason why i think this is possibly what we're seeing here so be careful if you get involved in this because this could be the game changer for your eternity that's right yeah, watch out for the YouTube rabbit holes that you can go down so easily to watching videos about UFOs. Yep. And so in the new age, there was an obsession with alien implants. And there was quite a few so-called spiritual healers who would offer for a fee to remove your alien implants for you. Could you please talk about that? Yeah, alien implants. Um, keep in mind, this delusion is is to be so good that even the very elect would be deceived if it was possible. So this delusion is going to be multifaceted and very, very deep in nature, and very, very layered, which it is. Uh, it seems like as you start into this research and this phenomenon, it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper. But that's the reason for it. So you never get to the truth of it. Um, the only truth of it can come from the Holy Spirit himself. You know, it's got to it's got to set you free. Um, but you looking at it on your own, you're just going to get farther and farther down that rabbit hole. And these implants were part of that. Um, 
here's how the implants work. Uh, years ago, when I was working at a boat company, I ended up getting a sliver of uh, fiberglass in my finger right here. And it went in sideways and it was poking out the other side. And I took it to my supervisor and I said, uh, you got a pair of tweezers? Can you pull this out? And he looked at that and he goes, oh, you're not pulling that out. He said, one, fiberglass is barbed, a uh, sliver of fiberglass. And if I pull on, it's just going to break. He says, you need to go to the doctor and you're probably going to end up getting that cut out, which I did. So I ended up going to surgery and they cut this straight across and removed it straight out. And I had to go back a couple of weeks later to doctor's office to have him look at it, make sure it was okay. So this is the first time I've been to the doctor's office because first time I was went straight to surgery. And uh, I get in his office and I'm waiting, you know, he's busy and I'm waiting for him to talk to me and I'm looking around and there's this giant three foot wide by two foot high board on his wall and it's just full of garbage all stuck to it and some of these little plaques on it with dates and times and stuff and uh, I said you know when I got his attention I said can I ask you a question he said sure I said what is that and he says that's the many things that I dug out of people I said really I said, like what you dug out of my finger. And he says, yeah. And uh, I said, that's a lot of strange stuff. I said, one more question. He says, sure. I said, did everybody know how those things got into them? And he says, that's a very interesting question. And he says, the answer is no. He says, most people don't know where it came from. They just know that it started bothering them. And when we went to looking at it, it was a foreign object and needed to have it removed because it was irritating them. Thank you, sir. So I started looking at that in relation to the idea with implants, because a lot of this stuff could have passed for what people are called implants. Keep in mind, if we're dealing with a spiritual entity that knows us, has been around for a long time, sees everything we're doing. And as a child or maybe busy working somewhere and you pick up something under the skin and it tends to bother you or whatever, or something that's picked up somewhere along the line during your growing up years, um, you don't know about it, but they do. And you open these doors later in life and become an experiencer with them. You know, they can use that to perpetrate the experience to being more real. That makes complete sense. Mm -hmm. They can use whatever it takes to make the experience more believable. Yeah. So all of this is just suggestion. You know, I used to watch... Uh, the way Whitley Strieber worked with yes. the, uh, when he did his talks, you know, he loved opening up with asking people, how many people here, you know, 500 people in an audience and he, how many people here have got a scoop mark or, a, or a, you know, a, a, you know, a scar or, you know, something that under the skin, they don't, I don't know where it came from, you know, I can't remember. And 80% uh, of the audience would raise their hand. Mm. Well, He's telling them that there's a good possibility you might be an experiencer. Excuse me, but that's the power of suggestion right yeah, there. Yeah. That's dangerous, putting that thought into people's minds. Mm -hmm. And you brought that up earlier is when like somebody that had these memories, um, they want to go find out about it. Well, you know, I told you they come to me when they say, you know, I've had this dream. Well, that dream is something related to something you've already heard about or seen on TV or movies or something or read about mm -hmm. because none of this is brand new, but you want to pursue it. So you're going to go talk to your family doctor, right? No, you're not because he's going to think you're crazy and going to want to put you on some medication. Yeah. So who are you going to search out? 
you're going to search out somebody that'll listen to you. And that's going to be somebody in the UFO community. So you are already setting yourself up. You are already setting that stage to be, that you're to be a believer. You understand? That person you're going to doesn't even have to do it himself to you. He doesn't have to give you leading questions. You already went to that person with the idea that you're an experiencer. Mm -hmm. You've already given over to this spiritual beings that, yep, I'm all game for this. Feed me. That's right. Yeah, that that appetite for mystical experiences is dangerous. Yes. And we need to be very careful and stay in God's word. It's the same way in, in the Christian church, though, too. Mm -hmm. You have to watch for that where people get more involved looking for that experience than the relationship, you know, and, and I see a lot of that uh, happening. If you get people coming out of the new age and you're bringing them into this, this, you know, the new truth of Christianity, mm -hmm. but they realize also that there's signs and wonders in Christianity and you've got to be able to ground them into the relationship first not let them run after yeah. the signs and wonders which is what they were chasing in the first place in the new age that's right amen yeah you're right on dr stephen greer started the um conspiracy theory that the government was planning on doing a massive um illusion of an alien uh invasion in order to control humanity have you heard anything about that or is that something that is a master plan of Satan that the government's in uh, using? It's uh, a theory that's been around for quite a long time. Uh, okay. I think one of the titles for it was Blue Beam. Years mm -hmm. and years it's been around. Um, even going back, there's a lot of Christian theologians that think that it's a good possibility. It may not be that the government's doing it, but Definitely that it's a it's going to be a ruse from the enemy um, to, to give that kind of deception. Even uh, my mentor in the beginning of all of this, Dr. David Allen, the late Dr. David Allen Lewis, who wrote UFO End Time Delusion back in the uh, early 90s, um, he saw that as a possibility, you know, that this is going to be a, a you know, a great delusion in the end. Mm -hmm. It's going to um, confuse everybody, you know. Um, but whether it's the government pulling it, you know, that's going to be pulling it, who knows? Okay. You know? So, so like a war of the worlds, um, that the enemy could mimic possibly, you know? Okay. Yeah. And, and so just for those who haven't really studied the Bible, can you confirm that aliens are not in the Bible, that this is not part of revelation or any end times prophecy? Never seen it. I have been over and over and over it. Never seen anything in there. It has to do with aliens. Everything is only have to do with God's angels that are coming with Jesus in the end. Um, you see that the enemy is going to be working against us, which is a demonic realm. But there's nothing in there about aliens from other worlds. And like I said, you get to the very end. The only ones that are going to be in heaven are the righteous uh you know, the righteous descendants of Adam and Adam's from earth. Are you telling me that if God had created all those other worlds out there, that they are doomed from the beginning, that they have no opportunity? But none of that makes sense. You got to keep in mind, you know, that these questions we ask like that, they're, they're, they're coming from our thinking, but we're trying to put our thinking in God's mind. OK, you, you can't do that. Yeah. You, you got to look at the Bible as what God wrote it as. Take off our take off our our worldview glasses of whatever they are that we come from and read the word as what it is. Amen. Yeah. God said through the prophet Isaiah, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Exactly. Yeah. Well, this has been just fascinating, and I am so excited to share this with everyone, Joe. Is there anything else that we haven't covered that you'd like to uh, share with us today? Um, I just hope everybody gets an opportunity to share this information with not just friends or, you know, but 
your your children and grandchildren they're important because they're the generation that's getting hit most with this right now because it's all getting you know pumped at them through hollywood through television through the movies through youtube you know we see aliens connected with everything they're being conditioned to where they think this is okay everything you look at with the whole marvel thing and all of that is all about saviors coming from space you know, alien saviors, you know, we have a savior and he did come and he's coming again, but he's not an alien from another world. He's the creator of the universe himself. And that's the thing about this whole thing with Stephen Greer is they're pushing this CE5 that you can communicate with these beings. And that, the question I ask, and I asked it at the first talk I ever did as a believer. And it happened to be at a new age conference because they really didn't know what I was bringing to the conference. But I asked the question in that conference, which was full of people that were, you know, fortune tellers and everything else. And I asked them, I said, why would you want to follow anything but the creator himself? Why would you want to follow a lesser God? a small g. Why would you not want to follow the creator of the universe himself, the creator of all? Why would you settle for less? That's my question to those that are looking at this idea of communicating with these beings. They're all lesser beings. You can have a relationship with the creator of all. You personally. That's right. Yeah, the creator of all who loves you. These yes. demons do not love us. They hate us. They want to destroy us. They want to yeah. take our souls to the lair that God created for the fallen angels the, yep. to, he to hell. And they are not someone we should be chasing after or asking to invite into our lives. No, and it, it, it's another strange thing. And when I talk to these people, too, I said, you know, you don't know me. If I came to your door and I said, hey, let me into your house. You'd say, no, I don't know who you are. I say, but it's okay that you invite these beings into your mind, but you won't let me into your house. You have That's no right. idea who they are. That's right. Yeah. Wow. So much to think about. Please visit the links that are in the description below to the website CE4 Research and also to pre-order or if, if you're watching this video later to order joe's book on this topic and this has just been fascinating thank you so much thank you for having me on